Well, I see it takes people some time to come back into the auditorium in between sessions, and I think that's probably a good thing. I hope that you're having good conversation. I uh, hope marriages are being strengthened. I hope nobody's getting into a fight. If you are, come talk to me, and we'll do a, we'll do a quick mini-session <laughs> uh, together. In all honesty, you know, I, I typically tell couples uh, in counseling and at sessions like this, the most important time is actually, I think, the ride home today, you know? I think the hour before and the hour after a marriage counseling conference like this is, is when you go home, it's the conversation of what did you learn and what did you pick up? And so I know that in terms of prayers, that's what my prayers are for, is that on the way home, this conversation continues on. Well, friends, we are in our third session. We're talking about resolving conflict in marriage. And I, I, I want to give you, in, in brief, I want to try to give you a biblical theological framework to understand conflict at its largest scale, because I think oftentimes we approach conflict with typically negative feelings. We, if I said, how many of you view conflict in marriage negatively, most of us probably would raise our hands, yes. It's typically not something that we view as a positive in marriage, but something that typically leads to disconnection. But I actually think that conflict can lead to connection. So, Here's the biblical theological framework to put conflict in. At creation, there is no conflict. Man and woman, Adam and Eve, are living in a garden. They're walking with God in the coolness of the day. Zero conflict, no fighting. I mean, just think about that for a moment. Imagine not even having an inkling or an inclination to ever be frustrated, to ever be irritated, to ever need to insist on your own way, to never be, I mean, that's what the Garden of Eden was, zero conflict. In the fall, we see conflicts, uh, fruits immediately begin to take place, all of those different avenues, conflict with God, conflict with creation, conflict with ourselves, and primarily conflict uh, with the other individual. The story of the Bible in some ways is really driven by that conflict of what is God going to do with this cosmic conflict between himself and between us? And one of the great things that we see biblically from this, from this framework is God does not typically do what you and I do with conflict. He doesn't step away from conflict, right? God doesn't look at the mess of humanity, the sin that, has, that, that, has, that is, is present in the human heart, and he doesn't just say, ugh, that's a little messy. I'm just gonna kind of put that on hold and not really deal with it, right? He doesn't sweep it under the rug as it were. You know what God does with conflict? He sends his one and only son, Christ, in human flesh to enter into the story of human conflict to what? To redeem it, right? God does not move away from conflict. He sees conflict as an opportunity for his glory, right? So you can already begin to see where I'm headed with this, right? And with this story and why scripture is so important for how we do marriage. Because God in Christ sees human conflict and he says, you know what? I am willing to get my hands dirty. I am willing to enter into the mess of it. I am willing to enter into the span and time of human history and to move towards conflict, not away from it. So Jesus Christ then is our model and our motivation. He looks at conflict and he redeems it, right? He restores what, what conflict can all be about in the sense of it's an opportunity then for reconciliation and to bring glory to God, all of which is pushing us forward, right? Every moment of conflict then is an opportunity for reconciliation and restoration, which is then preparing us for what? It's preparing us for our fullest and our final destination in heaven where there is no crying, no tears, right? There's no more mourning, right? There's no more conflict, And so, friends, what I want to offer to you today, just in simple, and we'll talk about this in a second, is that every time then you choose to enter into conflict in a Christ-like way, you live the story of the gospel, right? What I'm trying to do today is to give you various practical ways that you get to be on mission in your marriage, right? What does that even mean, have a gospel-centered marriage? Well, here's one of them. One of the ways that you have a gospel-centered marriage is you embrace and enter into conflict, right, in a Christ-like way. You move towards it. You don't move away from it. Now, oftentimes, we get ourselves into trouble with conflict because we butt heads and we don't do conflict well. And so today in our session, during our time, I want to talk about that and talk about why conflict goes bad and to try to give you a little bit of a framework of how you can do conflict in your marriage. So, with that being said, if you have your Bibles, turn over with me to James chapter 4. 
James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I'll just read it for you while you're turning there. James says this. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you, right? Hey, great question. James is telling us, get ready, because I'm about to tell you. It's like that bright flashing sign. He says, quote, is it not this, that your passions, or the word there is epithumia, right? Your desires, your expectations, right? Is it not that your desires, your expectations, your passions are at war within you? You desire and you don't have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. One of my favorite illustrations of this passage is uh, David Palliston, who uh, one, one of uh, Lucy I, and I, I think we're talking about this class. David Palliston teaches a class uh, called Dynamics of Biblical Change at CCEF. And when he talks about this passage, he says, so oftentimes in conflict, you can imagine two people as two books, right? And in conflict, it's like this. They're just going like this. They're just up against one another. They're fighting, they're banging heads. And Pallison said, what scripture teaches us to do is instead of doing this, what we should do is do this, right? We should open up and find out what's going on inside the heart. And friends, that's exactly what James says. James says, listen, you wanna know why this is happening? Well, open up your heart, right? Open up the book, as it were, and understand where those desires are coming from. Another way to say it that I like to tell couples is that there is always a war going on inside of you before there is ever a war going on outside of you. So let me say that again. There is always a war going on inside of you before there is ever a war going on outside of you. What that means, friends, for us today is that before there's ever external conflict where you're yelling at your wife or where you're getting irritated with your husband, before that even happens, right? Before the the eye roll happens, before the cold shoulder happens, before the stiff arm happens, before any of that happens, James is saying there's already a war going on inside of you, right? So we could probably have conflict right now and right here if we just simply understood that process. That what James is saying here is he's saying, listen, you want to know why all of this stuff is happening outside of you? Well, stop looking at your spouse and look where, right? Look at yourself. And I go back to one of the things I tell couples all the time. You are your biggest problem in your marriage relationship, not the person sitting next to you. It's your own heart. James says, listen, what causes fights and quarrels among you is you had these passions, you had these desires, you had these expectations that you want and then you don't get. So what I want you to do is go back to that diagram, right, of expectations that I showed you. Why are my wife and I getting in a fight? It is not because she's critiquing my driving, right? What's going on between that? Remember those little blue hearts that were at the root of those expectations, right? The root of that desire and that expectation is I have a desire to be affirmed. I have a desire to be in control. I have a desire and expectation that I should be praised for putting this trip together and, and, and that, that she should see what a good husband I am. That is the desire that's at war with me. So when I don't get that desire, when she doesn't just fall head over heels and say, oh my goodness, thank you for doing this, And she says something like, hey, be careful when you drive, that sparks conflict. Now, we could spend an hour talking about my driving, right? But that would be completely missing the mark because what James is saying is, listen, don't have the conversation about what's going on outside of you. Have the conversation about what's going on inside of you. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a few moments. Frustrated desires and frustrated expectations, according to James's inner pathology, we might call it, of conflict, is what drives conflict. Now, turn over in your Bible then to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. I don't have a slide for this, so we'll just turn over there together. If we know that that is our tendency then, is to have all of these passions and these desires at war within us, then the call on our life then is, is we have to build unity in the midst of those desires and expectations which go awry, which is exactly what Paul commands us to in Ephesians 4. He says, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord, verse 1, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, and here's the phrase, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Listen, you will not naturally fall into peace after conflict. 
That is not how conflict works. Conflict almost always pushes you apart when it's not done in a Christ-like way. Conflict has to be engaged in a Christ-centered and in a biblical way in order to build unity. You actually have to, Paul says, make every effort to do this, right? You actually have to extend effort. You have to extend yourself in vulnerability and being able to say, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And friends, that's one of the big differences between how secular marriages handle conflict and, and difficulties in marriage as opposed to how we do it, right? Conflict is not something to stay away from. It's an opportunity to build that Christ-like unity in your marriage. So how do we do that? How do we do this, right? If we realize then that couples aren't just gonna naturally fall into unity together. Well, here are some practical things, right? As we think about leaving out of here today, I wanna make sure that you have some practical tools to actually address some of these different things. So number one, have a plan for addressing conflict in marriage, right? You probably have a lot of plans. You probably have a retirement plan. You probably have a fire escape plan for your house. You probably have plans for a lot of different things. You probably have plans for how you divide up duties in your house or who pays the bills or who cooks dinners or uh, what chores or what kids' is responsibilities, right? We, we like to plan, I think, normally in our culture, but one of the things that I am surprised by is how oftentimes couples do not have a plan for conflict. And because couples have so much conflict, typically, I'm surprised that because it's something that they know is going to happen, you would think that we would actually have a plan or a process for dealing with it. And yet so oftentimes we find ourselves caught off guard. So we're having conflict in front of our kids. We're having conflict on the way to church on a Sunday morning. We're having conflict on special anniversary dates. We're having conflict everywhere at all times. And we find ourselves completely caught off guard. But friends, it shouldn't be so. Right? James already tells us in James 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, he says, Brothers, consider it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds, not if, but when. Right? We know that the daily rhythm of life, because you're married to a sinner and because you're a sinner, you're inevitably going to have conflict. So have a plan. Right? What are elements of a plan? Well, where are you going to do it? Right? Couples will tell me all the time, well, we just always end up fighting in front of our kids or we're fighting on our way out or we're fighting when he comes home from work. And I say, well, why don't you just have a plan and a time for when you have those conversations, right? And, and, and you would think that that's a super novel idea, but they'll, they'll begin to implement that and they will be surprised then how differently their conflict will go. Have a plan, right? Here, here are some of my best ideas when it comes to plan. It's probably never best to have this uh, happen over a text message, right? Uh, we shouldn't be solving conflicts over voicemails and text messages or emails or however else you might be doing it, right? Uh, it's probably not wise to have conflict when we're feeling really heated, right? When there's a high level of emotion or anger or frustration. Uh, one of the dynamics that we talk about in marriage counseling is emotional flooding, right? Emotional flooding is when you're feeling a lot of feelings and you're feeling them so high and so hot and at such an intensity that you're not able to have civil and compassionate and Christ-like conversation. So just setting out some basic tools for when you're going to do it, where you're going to do it, right? Uh, I typically tend to think it's probably not best to have conflict in the bedroom, right? I think a lot of couples, uh, the bedroom is a place of intimacy, of uh, both intimacy that is physical and spiritual and emotional. And when you begin to have constant chronic conflict in your bedroom, right, you begin to have negative associations with, with the bedroom, right? So maybe we have conflict outside. We're going to sit on the deck or we're going to sit in the living room or let's talk to each other across the table. But just, again, very simple practical tools for what's your plan for conflict, maybe even a time, right? Um, I had a couple say, listen, we, wanna, we don't want conflict to extend beyond an hour, right? If we can't get through this conversation, if we can't really minister grace to one another and come to a sense of Christ-like consensus, then we need to take a pause. Like, I, I know couples that they will do conflict, I call them conflict marathons, where they will just talk and talk for hours and hours on end to where they don't even know what they're talking about, Right? They've completely forgotten what the actual origin of the conflict is. And maybe you've been at that spot, right? So having a plan might involve place, location, timing, etc. Number two, set goals for your communication. Set goals for your communication. I will say this. There are only two ways or two things that come out of your mouth. 
biblically speaking, from Luke 6, 43 through 45, right? We're talking about the good treasure that's brought out of a good heart versus bad words that come out of a treasure, bad treasure that's stored up in the heart. And Jesus says there in that passage, he says, out of the abundance of the what? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there's no neutral thing in communication. And so one of the things I'll tell my kids and that my wife and I have tried to use in conversation is that we are either building up or we are tearing down. There is no gray area when it comes to communication. I am either building my spouse up or I am tearing her down. Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to those who hear. Husbands, when you talk to your wife, you are either building her up or you are tearing her down. Wives, when you uh, talk to your husbands, you are either building him up or you're tearing him down. There is no neutral communication. And so when we talk about setting goals for biblical communication, right, what does that look like? Right, well, the Bible has a lot to say about how we speak to one another. You think about the Proverbs that say something like this, that, that sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness, right? That's one of my favorites. Sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. So what the Proverbs seem to be saying is that there is a way that I can speak with my speech that is sweet and that is, that is compassionate and warm that actually will increase the overall persuasiveness of my argument. Or another proverb says something like this, that there's one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise, what, brings healing, right? That I can either, in my communication, be like a soldier who is taking a sword and literally thrusting it into my wife's side, or I can use the power of my tongue to minister grace and healing, right? Proverbs 18.2 is another one of my favorites. It says a, a, a fool, right, only takes pleasure in expressing his own opinions, Right? but a man of understanding is willing to listen, right? In, in communication, are you the person who can't stop talking? Well, that's probably not a good method to follow if we think about biblical patterns of communication, right? In Psalm 103, it says, where there are many words, transgression is what? Unavoidable, right? So it seems that, that, that in communication and in conflict, the more words that we use, right, it actually can lead to, to, to a downturn in conflict, not the opposite way around, right? When you go to James 1.19, right, where we are called to be slow to anger, slow to speak, and quick to what? Quick to listen. I tell husbands and wives, God gave you two ears and one mouth. So it seems like the, the ratio, right, of listening to speaking is probably better seen as a two to one, right? And sometimes I think we get it opposite. We like to speak more than we like to listen, so when we set goals for biblical communication, what kind of goals are you gonna have, right? How are you going to speak to one another? What is the goal? After the end of a conflict, here's a practical way to see whether or not you've achieved your goal is are you closer together or are you further apart, right? If you have ministered grace to those who hear, if you have tried to build up, you know what's gonna happen at the end of conflict? Exactly what happens when Christ enters into conflict. What happens when Christ enters into conflict? He draws us further away? No. He draws us closer together. And friends, that's then the model and motivation for how we do conflict. Set, set goals then for your communication. Number, number three, pay attention to your posture, your timing, and your tone. Again, things that we've already talked about before, but timing, posture, and tone is so important. Number four, identify the real problem. Identify the real problem. And again, going back to what we said earlier, we typically tend to conceptualize of conflict as being the thing that is outside of us, right? We are fighting over X when the answer and what's really going on as we've seen earlier from the book of James is what's going on inside. Uh, I will have couples come to my office and a lot of times couples, when it comes to marriage counseling, they essentially want their marriage counselor to be an umpire, not a counselor. Meaning they wanna come in, they wanna verbally vomit on the counselor and they want the counselor to kind of call balls and strikes. Like, yeah, you were right, oh no, 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 you, know, you were wrong. Oh no, you, know, you probably should have done this and no, cut it out, like that wasn't right. Typically, that's what couples come into marriage counseling hoping for, that the counselor's gonna set their husband straight or the counselor's gonna set their wife straight, call balls and strikes. But friends, when we think about conflict, right, when we think about identifying the real problem, again, most of the time, the problem is not the problem that you think it is. Most of the time, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And so a lot of times, I will just ask a simple question. I'll just say, what's really going on here? Like, I really don't think this is about X, 
right? I, I really don't think that it's about you picking up your laundry and putting it in the laundry basket, right? I think that there's probably something else that's underneath that, right? I had a couple very early on, and that was just a, a huge source of conflict for them. They just have argument over argument about it, about how he didn't keep the house, how he wasn't helpful, etc. And they would just have fight after fight about housekeeping type things, about vacuuming and bathroom and cleanliness, etc. And we all know, right? We all know that that's not what the conflict was about. It was about him considering her, considering what she was going through in a day, considering all of the difficulties and the hardships of being a stay-at-home mom and, and having to manage a home. And so it wasn't about laundry on the floor, but it was about his inconsideration of her, his valuing of her. And she was like, listen, even if you would even verbally affirm that you value me or that you love me, then yeah, it wouldn't be a huge deal if you left your laundry on the floor. But every single day when what I interpret and what I see is just what I believe is an inconsideration, right, of of who I am and what I do, well, of course we're going to have conflict, right? He doesn't think it's a big deal, right? It's a huge source of conflict. But being able to say, listen, I'm not talking about the laundry. What I'm talking about is how you value me in this relationship. What I'm talking about is I feel like you take me for granted, right? What we're talking about is that you just expect that, that I'm going to be like your mom for you, right? That, that was really what was driving the conflict. That was really the James 4, the war that was going on inside of her far before it was her harsh, cynical, sarcastic comments about dirty laundry on the floor. So in that counseling room, right, we're able to say, okay, we're not even going to talk about the laundry. We're simply going to talk about what's below that iceberg. But you don't need me for that, right? You can do that. You can say, hey, what, what really is going on? What really is happening here when we have this conflict together? And I actually find oftentimes that fruitful progress can be made when we actually tend to identify what's actually going on. Part of the way that we do that then, and this is, again, building on that last session, is listening to your spouse, listening to your spouse's story. And here's where empathy becomes such an important part of dealing with conflict in marriage. I want to give you four core elements of empathy in marriage that all four elements have to be present. So you can write them down. And if you can do these four things, then I guarantee you that it will build empathy in your marriage. And empathy in connection yields positive results in marriage. So the first thing is that we listen. We listen to our spouse's perspective. We listen to their story. We listen to the words that are coming out of their mouth. We don't interrupt. We don't correct. We don't mansplain. We just simply listen to what is going on. That's number one. Listen to your spouse. Listen to their perspective. Number two, stay out of the judgment zone. Stay out of the judgment zone, right? Well, like, thanks for sharing that, but you know, if you did it like this, or if you did this, right? No, 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 that's not you staying out of the judgment zone. That is you making a judgment. That's you making a pronouncement, right? After you listen, don't make a judgment or a suggestion. Just simply listen. You might say something like this to stay out of the judgment zone. You might say, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for saying that. I didn't know that that's how you felt, right? One of the things that will cut connection in relationships is when we immediately jump to judgment or immediately jump to condemnation, right? I had a couple, and we'll talk about later in in this uh, conflict pattern. Every time she would even try to be vulnerable, what I call the, 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 the turtle reaction, her husband would just slam her right away. And like a little turtle, she would kind of immediately shrink back. And in his mind, he's doing something good. He's trying to, what he would say, help her, right? She didn't view it or take it as helping, right? She viewed it as harsh and condemning and attacking. And so every movement forward with vulnerability, she just got a trained response of it wasn't valued. It wasn't stewarded well until she, she just essentially shut down on him. And so the husband and the wife were coming into marriage and the husband's saying, she's so cold. She's built emotional walls. She won't open up to me. And as we talked about it and helped him understand, well, listen, yeah, she might bear some responsibility, but you also bear some responsibility in that right? Every single time she tries to be vulnerable, right? You don't stay out of the judgment zone. You actually, you actually run into the judgment zone, and you actually try to make condemnations and suggestions. So we listen to perspective. We stay out of the judgment zone. Number three, we identify the dominant emotion. We identify the dominant emotion. 
So this is where it might take a little bit of emotional intelligence work on our part. And again, men, I think that we can grow in this area. Women, I think you can grow in this area as well. And we'll talk about a way to do that in just a second. But identify the dominant emotion. Is it fear? Is it guilt? Is it embarrassment? Is it anger? Is it frustration? Is it joy or happiness? Is it she's left out? She feels misunderstood. Identify what the dominant emotion is. And the fourth step is connect with that. Connect with that emotion, right? So part of empathy is that instead of looking at the person who is drowning in the sea and taking a life jacket and tossing it over and saying, hey, looks like you're drowning and here, I hope you can catch this life vest. That's sympathy, right? That's saying, hey, I see you suffering. Here's a tool and hope you can catch it and hope you survive. Empathy is you get out of the boat yourself and you swim over and you take the life jacket and you put it on her or you put it on him and you say, let's go back together. Let's get back to safety together. That's what empathy is. It is a witness in the midst of those difficult times. So what we mean by that is, let's say that the dominant emotion then is frustration, that you identify it and that you connect with it. So an internal dialogue that might go in your, on in your heart and mind might be is, has there ever been a time where I've been irritated? Okay, I know what it's like to be irritated. I know that feeling, right? I know it can just feel, it can feel so frustrating, right? Irrita excuse me, irritation can feel frustrating and it can feel like everything's just spinning out of control. You identify it and you name it and you connect with that. And that connection and that identification then is hopefully yielding itself and lending itself towards empathy, right? That you move towards and you say, okay, I know what this feels like. I know what it feels like to feel out of control and it doesn't feel good. And I know that it didn't feel good to feel that way alone. And so I actually wanna hop out of the boat and I wanna come over and join with her. Friends, that is a part of what I'm talking about when I say listen to your spouse's story. What I'm talking about, there is shorthand for that empathy and that connection. Listening to perspectives, staying out of the judgment zone, identifying the emotion, and then connecting with that. L let me give you a let me give you a story. So I was talking just recently to a, to a couple. Husband's a pastor, wife's a pastor's wife, very busy lot of drama going on. Uh, in this past year, they have lost three of their four parents, and it's just been a time of high stress, high grief. They live in a new area, and uh, the church where the husband is at is asking the husband to actually church plant. Uh, they, they want him to go and to start a church plant uh, across town. And there's just, this conversation has just yielded an incredible amount of conflict in their relationship. And again, you probably already can begin to connect some dots, right? What she is feeling is very left out, very not considered, right? She is feeling like, okay, this is just another sacrifice as a pastor's wife that I'm gonna have to make. He views this as something very good. He wants to do this. This is what he went to school for. And he's begun to resent her from, quote unquote, holding him back holding their family back. This is a good thing. Can't you see it? It's a ministry and God's given us this gift. And she's saying, well, you don't know what life is like here with three kids, right? I don't have the support that I used to have with my mom because she died. And he doesn't understand it. He doesn't get this. And so again, a ton of conflict, a ton of misunderstanding. And so, so much of our time together has simply been this, of just each of them expressing this. What she had been communicating was just suck it up, buttercup. I just have to go along. But she's not been able to do it. So some of her responses towards him can get prickly. They can get, they can get sensitive. They can, be, they can be very condemning and sarcastic. And he was misreading that, right, as exactly that, as being disrespectful. But as we begin to peel back some of those layers and he had a chance to hear her story and to empathize with it, it yielded a greater connection, right? One of the assignments I gave him was from Romans 12, this passage that says, listen, uh, love, love sincerely, right? Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. And there was this wonderful moment in the relationship where as we were talking, he said, listen, I have not loved you sincerely. He said, I've actually, I think, loved my own sin, my own things that I'm trying to pursue and I've not clung to you. You're good in our relationship and he goes, I want to hate my sin so I can cling and hold fast to you. She just broke down in tears and started crying. Why? Because she felt understood, right? She wasn't the enemy. She wasn't holding him back. 
right? She wasn't, she wasn't that, that harsh, contentious wife. What he saw and what he was able to hear from her as she shared her story was a story of hurt and a story of pain and a story of grief. And he saw that and was able to recognize that and attend to it. Friends, that's what we're talking about in conflict in marriage is listening to your spouse's story, not making those assumptions. And oftentimes, I would say really in most of the time, that's going to yield a better result in conflict. Some of you on this emotion part, you might say to yourself, okay, I just don't like talking about feelings, right? I just did not grow up in a context. And so uh, a lot of times in counseling, I'll use this word bank of feelings or an emotion wheel. If you've done any work with child or adolescent counseling, you're probably familiar with emotion wheels. They're just different ways that you can kind of locate words for your experience. Uh, I use this a lot with my own kids. You know, when they're in conflict or where uh, they're feeling overwhelmed, I'll just say, well, let's, let's look at some different emotions and find out what's really going on. Is there a word here that better or more accurately describes what's going on, right? I I, I think I find a lot of times for both husbands and wives in different ways, uh, this can actually be really helpful. Meaning, a wife might read her husband's responses, at least the tip of the iceberg is anger, right? She might say, he's just a really angry person. But we give him this word bank, right? And we say, is anger the best word to describe what's going on internally? A lot of times it's not. A lot of times a word that I get from husbands are words like ashamed, embarrassed, disliked, right? I had one husband say, I just, I don't think I can ever please her. I just don't. Her dad walked on water and I just know I will never ever measure up to him. What his wife constantly saw, though, as angry, responsive, or defensive responses was actually just a feeling of being disliked, of not measuring up, right? And so being able to take this and say, so I look at him and say, okay, so Bob, why don't you look at Lauren, and why don't you just simply tell Lauren, hey, Lauren, when you say this, right, I want to believe the best about you, but the impact of what you say, this is how it makes me feel, Right? When, when you make a criticism of this and, and I respond angrily, right, and I maybe lash out, what I want you to know is that underneath that, what's really going on is I just feel like you don't like me and that you're moving away from me, right? And then Lauren looks at me and goes, That's not, no, I do like you. I love you, right? And so again, what this does is it helps build that empathetic connection, Because if Bob can name what's going on, and if Lauren can connect with that, empathy moves towards connection. They can have a better connection during conflict instead of feeling like they're on opposite sides. So husbands, wives, you can cut this out of your handout, fold it, put it in your wallet, or take a picture of it. But I utilize this word bank of feelings quite a bit in counseling and even in my own relationship of just saying what's actually going on below the surface. Uh, Next thing. Uh, introduce three possibilities. I would say every couple should have these three questions at the ready to be able to bring out in terms of a conflict conversation. Number one, did I say something wrong? Did I do something wrong? Or was the manner of what I said or did wrong? The first two are more oriented towards content where the last is more based on tone. Now, notice what these questions are not. Did my spouse say something wrong? Did my spouse do something right? Because you always can answer that. But what we need to answer in times of conflict is, did I do something wrong? Was it my timing? Was it my tone? Did, did I lead with a negative or did I lead with an encouragement? One of the things we talk about in marriage counseling, again, is harsh startups versus soft startups. And one of the things that I can almost, from the very beginning of a conflict conversation, I can tell you if it's going to end poorly or if it's going to end well. And it's all based off of the startup. A soft answer turns away wrath, but what? Grievous words stir up anger, Proverbs 15.1. A conflict can have a harsh startup when it's accusatory or when I immediately identify the wrong, right? Say, well, you always do this. You're just like your mom. Or why do you do that? Or why, right? That's called a harsh startup. It immediately is going to pave the way for a negative interaction. Whereas a positive or a soft startup might be something like this. Hey, There is so much good that you do here at home. There's so many ways that you serve well and that you love well, right? That's a soft startup, right? We are paving the way then for positive positive feedback. Think about the Apostle Paul. I think he's a model exemplar of this. In every single one of his letters, except for one, he says something good about the people that he's writing to. 
I mean, even the churches that are incredibly messed up, like at Corinth, right? In 1 Corinthians, tons and tons of problems. I mean, four letters, right, to them to get some type of Christ-like repentance. And in chapter 1, he tells the church at Corinth, he says, I see every spiritual gift at work among you. Right? That's a soft startup, right? Hey, there's a lot of bad. There's lawsuits and people sleeping with their mothers and there's, you know, people are not exercising. I mean, there's a hot mess going on here but that's not going to keep me from identifying what's good here. Soft startup then can yield to a better end result. So being able to say, hey, you know what? I think this conversation is starting off wrong because I started it off wrong, right? I think I got us off onto the wrong foot. And could I just, could I, could I just get a mulligan here? Could I actually redo this and just start off by saying this? and then say something positive, say something encouraging. So introduce these possibilities. This is something that internally you would be doing, right? Did I say something wrong? Did I do something wrong? Or was the manner of what I said or did wrong? A next thing is take a look at your conflict and see if you can notice any patterns. That's the fill-in-list patterns. Now, I, I wanted to show you a common pattern that I encounter a lot in marriage. It's when one spouse's sin or weakness, right, comes out in marriage, right? Maybe a spouse says something in an unkind way. Uh, Oftentimes opens up an opportunity for another spouse or the other spouse, namely, to have an unbiblical response. So maybe you think about a couple that is a blow-up, blow-up combination, right? That diagram I showed you earlier. So when something goes wrong in marriage, an unmet expectation, it's like, hey, get your boxing gloves on because we're just going to go toe-to-toe. So one spouse blows up, the other spouse matches that, right? An unbiblical response. The other spouse uh, reacts sinfully to that, conflict ensues, and then there's not biblical resolution. And we'll talk about that in another session. This cycle is just a common cycle, right? One spouse does something, the other spouse responds negatively to it. That spouse then responds to that spouse's negative response. And I call this the merry-go-round of crazy. I tell couples all the time that the definition of insanity is what? It's doing the same thing, but expecting different results. So many couples, I will say, let's just plot out your conflict, how you guys do it, and let's just keep replaying it because that's what you're doing, right? You keep having essentially the exact same conflict. And every time you do it, you're expecting different results and it's driving you crazy because you're expecting different results. So go back to that, that couple I was talking to you about earlier where the husband was always attacking his wife. So one spouse's sin or weakness, right? At least for, for them, she would, here's how her pattern would go. Uh, she would kind of get the courage up to be vulnerable, right? And she would share something. She would mention something. She would share a little piece of what was going on in her heart. Her spouse would immediately just come at her with a hammer, just shut her down, say something in kind, make a suggestion, you need help, you need to get counseling, and, and she would just shut down. Well, over typically about a week-long dynamic, their conflicts would last a good week. Over that week, because of that shutting down and that coldness, she would just completely ice him out. She wouldn't talk to him. She wouldn't cook for him. She wouldn't do anything for him, which only did what for him? He just got more and more enraged and more and more upset till finally she would typically have her breaking point and she would lash out at him uh, in, in somewhat abusive ways. She would throw things at him. She would yell. She would make threats. She would say things, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to leave you. Uh, I want a divorce, right? That was the cycle. And that cycle would keep going on. And then after her negative response, that oftentimes would then justify his own responses in his mind, right? He would kind of take that blowing up and he would lord that over her, right? He would say, well, see, that's why I'm making this observation or making this comment. And they had done this for about 15 years, right? And so coming into, the, coming into the marriage counseling room, all we did is we just, up on a whiteboard, just drew out the pattern of their conflict. Now, you would have thought that I was telling them something new for the very first time, but it wasn't. But just seeing it, just actually seeing the patterns, almost the exact words or catchphrases that they would use. And here's what I would tell couples. I say at any single spot, one of you, only one of you can make a choice to have a biblical response and to get off the merry-go-round of crazy. It only takes one of you. It doesn't even take both of you. Ideally, I'd love to have both of you, but all it takes is maybe one spouse to be filled with the Spirit and to have a different response. 
That can change the trajectory of a conflict. It can change the trajectory of a conflict pattern, right? So for the husband, I could say, hey, when your wife, right, when your wife is actually starting to open up, instead of your first response to be an attack, I want your first response to just be silence. I just want you to zip your lips. I want you to get a piece of duct tape if that's what you need. I just want you to stick it over your mouth. Because every time you tend to respond and lash out, that is not making this go anywhere. And what happened for her is that instead of having two minutes to talk before she got attacked, she was able to say things that would go 10 or 15 minutes, right? That he was actually able to hear a longer narrative and he was able to say, oh, well, actually hearing more of what she was saying helped me understand her better, right? And again, it's like a light bulb moment goes off on him but I'm like, yeah, that's, that's right, right? If you don't constantly just beat your wife down, you actually might actually hear something that's worth hearing and taking to heart. And you know what would happen for her? That after two or three of these cycles where she was actually heard and open and vulnerable, it actually created a degree of warmth in their relationship. And she started to move towards him which surprised him because at first it was so unsurprising because she had been so cold and it led to a lot of fruit in their marriage, all from just simply being able to identify whatever their conflict pattern was. Maybe that's you guys here today. What is your conflict pattern? Are there words that trip you up? Are there situations that tend to trip you up? Are there common scenarios or things that you tend to fight about? Identify those things. What do you tend to fight most about? Where do you tend to fight most? How do you tend to fight? Plot it out on some type of pattern and then begin to ask yourself, what could we do differently at any of these points? How could we say something different, do something differently, or change our posture to make that conflict go better? Uh, One of the last points that we want to cover here is know that there is always hope in the midst of conflict. And I, I I cannot stress this to you enough. Again, because of what we know about conflict biblically, because of the storyline that we've been plotting out, if, friends, if we know that the greatest, most cosmic conflict that ever existed, right, the conflict of conflicts was able to be resolved through our Savior Jesus Christ, you know what that tells you about your conflict? It tells you that you have hope. It tells you, friends, that there's hope in Christ to resolve your conflict. Now, let me tell you the inverse, If you do not have hope in conflict, if you just say, couples will tell me this, well, we're just going to agree to disagree. We just just see things fundamentally different. We're just going to part ways on this because we can't agree. Do you know functionally what you are doing? You are actually saying that you are better and more righteous than God. Because if God is able to work through and redeem the most cosmic conflict, i.e. the alienation that happens because of sin, if he is able to work through that and address it, then who are you and I to be able to say, I'm going to allow this incident to stand in the way of us having a unified relationship? Do you see the pridefulness in that? Do you see the gall in that in, in, in saying, well, it just is what it is? He's never going to change. She's never going to change. She's always going to be like that. That is actually probably one of the most damaging forms of pride that can affect Christian marriages. Our inability to resolve conflict biblically points to a fundamental lack of understanding of the gospel. And friends, if we do understand the gospel and we understand who Christ is and what he did with conflict, then we know that there is always hope. We know, according to Romans 8, that the same Spirit of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is at work in the lives of those who believe, right? That's, just think about that for a moment, right? The same Spirit of God that literally brought a dead man, physically dead, back to life, that is unbelievable, right? It's the resurrection. If the same Spirit of God that did that lives in you, then you can resolve conflict. You can move towards your spouse. You can deny your flesh and and walk in the spirit, right? Friends, that's why we always have hope. And so sometimes it might just be you name it, right? Husbands, it might just be you saying, hey, time out. I think we're losing our way. I know, I'm confident of this one thing. I know that it's hard right now, but I'm confident that we're gonna resolve this, right? Imagine what that might do for your wife in the conflict. 
how that sense of hopefulness might buoy the conversation. Or if a wife said to, said to her husband in the midst of conflict, say, I love you, and because I love you, I am committed to resolving this biblically. That's my hope, right? My hope is that I can be confident that the same God who is at work in me is at work in you, that he's doing a work of redemption, Philippians 1.6. Imagine if we had that mentality uh, in our marriages. Last one, resolve the conflict biblically. And I, I'm leaving this last, we're going to uh, cover that very last point a little bit later on compromise and consensus. I want to end on this because resolving the conflict biblically is going to be what we come to after lunch. I typically find couples do one of the first three in marriage when it comes to conflict. Some couples fight it out. Some couples just, it's a fake, fake piece. Other couples, I call it the fizzle method of like they start off strong and then it kind of just tapers off. And the conflicts don't get really resolved. They just tend to fizzle out and uh, get swept under the rug. So fight, fake, fizzle. What I'm gonna put forward to you as a little bit of a teaser for our session after lunch is that I think that the primary way that God calls us to resolve conflict is through biblical forgiveness, the practice of forgiveness. We're gonna talk about that, about what it is, what it isn't, how do we do it, and I am 100% that the number one key to a good marriage is the ability uh, to practice forgiveness. So some questions that you guys can carry together over lunch. And again, I think you have an hour for uh, your lunch session. You know, number one, what did you learn about conflict in this session? Again, every session, there's a lot of stuff that we're covering that we're talking about. Maybe the question is, hey, what's one thing you're taking away? One thing that sticks out to you. Number two, what leads to most of the conflicts you see in your marriage? Why is that so? And what I'm wanting you to see and what I'm wanting you to have the conversation of is what's underneath the tip of the iceberg, right? What are those frustrated desires that are inside, right? Honey, before there's ever a war outside, there's always a war inside. So let's do a better job at identifying that. And maybe that might really help us in how we do conflict. Number three, how can you better hand con handle conflict in your marriage? Even if you just take one of my suggestions from that, how to address conflict and just say, hey, let's focus on this we're gonna change our posture or we're gonna have better goals for our communication. Just choose one of those things. What might they be? And uh, I hope that these things, again, based off of all that we've talked about, will yield uh, just some positive fruit of unity uh, in your relationship together today. So with that being said, I think Pastor Mike's gonna come up and give us uh, some instructions for lunch and uh, we'll be dismissed.